Today I'm joined by Sydney Grad from that Raul Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, Michael Levitt, FSWC CEO, and of course our wonderful guest speaker, Sam Buckstein. To begin, Sydney will offer some opening remarks. Sydney Grad is currently in her fourth year of political studies at Queens and a creative intern at the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. She is also the granddaughter of three Holocaust survivors and hopes to pursue a career in public policy where she hopes to combat the rising climate of political distrust and the humanitarian crises seen around the world. We're happy she's here today. Welcome, Sydney. Thank you, Daniela, and thank you to Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center for co-hosting this important series with us. We are proud to partner with you on this and many other important initiatives in the pursuit of justice around the world. On behalf of the Rural Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, I want to personally thank our audience for joining us here today. Our center's mission is inspired by Rural Wallenberg, a non-Jewish Swedish diplomat stationed in Budapest during the Holocaust. He single-handedly saved tens of thousands of Jews from one of Nazis' most brutal killing fields. He demonstrated that one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can prevent evil and transform history. I'm honored to be here to witness and hear from Sam Buckstein. At a time when people are unable to come together physically, the importance of building online spaces that can be transferred to future generations is more important now more than ever. On behalf of the Rural Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, I want to thank him for being here with us today. Thank you all for joining us and enjoy the program. Thank you so much, Sydney. Thank you for being here and for the ongoing partnership with the Raul Wallenberg Center. At this time, I'm turning the stage over to our guest speaker, Sam Buckstein. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Sam Buckstein. I can see many of my family and friends uh, already logged into this, including Mr. Oscar Zaretsky himself. So hello to Oscar Zaretsky. Uh, I'm going to tell you Oscar's testimony today, which is a true testimony of the Holocaust. It is a chapter of the Holocaust by bullets, which happened in Eastern Europe, in the Soviet Union, in Poland. And I'm just going to switch really quick over to my presentation. And hopefully that's showing up for everybody. So I, I'm born and raised in Toronto. I'm 28 years old and I'm a solar energy engineer. So why am I doing this at all? Uh, first of all, I've always been very interested in history. And so particularly the history of the Second World War and how it's shaped who we are today is, is fascinating. But in this case, it's, this is a story of my grandfather, Oscar, and his siblings and how they survived the Holocaust. And it's a true story. It's the personal uh, story of how they survived and how I am before you today and how our family continued. But on a higher level, it's also a story of what people are capable of just in general, human beings, both their best and worst. It's a warning of, of what, it is a testament of one of the worst genocides in human history and also a warning of how that genocide can happen again. And that we need to be vigilant of our freedoms and, and carefully uh, protect them. A few years ago, I think it was two years ago now, my brothers and I uh, undertook to interview my grandfather over a course of five, six hours, and we asked him essentially his entire story, uh, and then broke that up into small little clips, which is in, in, interspersed throughout the following presentation. My brothers and I were witness to Oscar's testimony, and as a result of that, we are now responsible to share his story. Uh, so this really this entire project starts with my dad, who has a company out in Cambridge Kitchener Waterloo, and this this company undertakes Holocaust education in in that region because there aren't many Jewish children in Cambridge Kitchener Waterloo, and so the impact of Holocaust education is so much more important. So it's really thanks to my dad in the first place for really getting me into Holocaust education, and of course my grandfather is the person who I'm representing, and this picture here. Kind of shows us we're, we're all engineers and so I really really enjoy that but it's it's here that you see the bridge from one generation to the next of how we maintain and and keep these stories alive and bring the warnings forward to the next generation 
And just before I get too far, just to give you a sense of the kind of person that Oscar Zaretsky is, this is a, a picture. Recently, I installed solar panels on my parents' roof, and I'm up there at the top. And here's Oscar, who's my structural engineering consultant on the project, who at 86 insisted on climbing up this 25-foot ladder to go verify the installation himself, despite the fact that you know we could have done it for him. And I, I know what you're thinking, like, why, why, how could you ever let this is so irresponsible of you to let your 86 year old grandfather who's a Holocaust survivor to climb on a ladder. And you're right, but I really wouldn't be able to stop him even if I tried. Uh, but that gives you an idea of the intrepid individual that he is. So our story of Oscar, she's born in this town called Podhajce in 1934 in what was then Poland. And you can see here on this map what the borders of Poland were like before the Second World War. It's kind of shift 200 kilometers westward. So Podhajce is today in Western Ukraine, but back then was in Eastern Poland. And it's this kind of border region where there's a significant number of Jews, several thousand Jews, uh, a significant number of Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian Orthodox and Polish Catholics all kind of living together. Um, it's not peaceable, not amicably, but peacefully in one town. And when I first started doing this presentation, we didn't have access to Google. And but since then, Google has actually even taken pictures of all of these places, including Podhajce, of this tiny town in in Eastern Europe. And so you can just see here a couple of images of what it looks like today, including the synagogue and the Jewish cemetery, and just sort of a sense of that this is it's a it's a poor peasant farming community uh, even today. So here's Oscar describing. His, his recollections of what it was like to grow up in Podhajce. And here's my younger brother, Jonah. Oscar, will you tell me a little bit about um, the town you came from, Podhajce, and your family life you had there, your siblings, your parents? Okay. Um, for, as I said, what I understand is the Jewish people settled in, in 1640 in, in Podhajce, and it was a Jewish community ever since. We... we from what I understand uh, and what I remember is the house, the only place that we had a a wooden, uh, we, we had only a, one, uh, a wooden floor and the wooden floor was in the kitchen. The bedrooms and everything else was, was mud floor, was tamped and um, compact, this all was compacted and and this is how, uh, this is what we lived on. This was the standard, I guess, the roof the roofs in the house uh, or the houses were covered with uh, with thatched roofs. Uh, the the walls were made out of mud and so on, and they uh, uh, compressed, if you will. Uh, we, and we were considered to be wealthy. So you can imagine exactly what the life was like for the other Jews. Oscar, will you talk? Um, and this is a, another quick video of him describing his parents. Oscar, will you tell me a little bit about um, the town you came from, Oops, Podhajce? That's not good. Sorry. As you can see, Podhajce hasn't changed too much then as today. And uh, Oscar's recollection for the conditions that they were living in sort of is a testament to his observations uh, and his interest in the construction of his house. But let's hear a little bit about his parents. Oscar, what, what did your parents do? What were they like and what was their background? So, um, as I said before, my father was a farmer uh, and very, very strict. And whenever uh, my mother would report to him that I had some misdemeanor, he would have no qualms and in, in, in hitting me on my behind. And I used to get beaten virtually every day. That's what I remember. In fact, when, as soon as he came home, I would immediately bend down to expect to be beaten. So once once he, I asked him, why are you beating me now? I didn't do anything today. He said, that's for next time. So that's the, that, that was the way that they brought up children. I also don't remember ever being hugged and kissed by him. Uh, again, I don't think the children were being uh, hugged and kissed uh, because that was not the, the rigor of, of bringing up children. My mother, on the other hand, did, did hug and kiss, and she was very, very warm about, uh, and bringing up. So here's a couple of photos that we have of the family. 
uh, from before the war. You can see Oscar's mother, my great grandmother, uh, Branya Silver on the right, and then on the left, Branya is hidden. She's holding uh, Ziggy, Oscar's younger brother, and Oscar is on the horse with his older sister, Elsa. And then on this next picture, we have uh, a picture of Israel Silver. And you should note here that Israel is actually in an army uniform. Uh, he was a soldier for the Austro-Hungarian Kaiser during the First World War. So this, this will become significant. Um, and, and as Oscar was explaining, they were poor farmers. Oscar's grandmother, Sima Fish, was an illiterate woman, but she was a, quite a shrewd businessman. They had a businesswoman. They had a bricklaying factory. They employed uh, several members of the community. And so they had good relations with their neighbors, both Jewish and non-Jewish. Uh, and this, this will also become significant. So this next video is Oscar's first memory of the war. Well, before I get to that, as I mentioned before, uh, Israel is uh, Oscar and his family are living in this small town called Podhaitza, which is in eastern Poland. Uh, when the war breaks out in Europe in 1939, the po Poland is actually divided by the Germans and the Soviets. And you can see here that the western part goes to the Germans, the Nazis, and the eastern part goes to the Soviets. And Podhaitza actually falls in the Soviet sphere of occupation. So from about September until um, 1941, June of 1941, when the Germans invade the Soviet Union, Podhaitz is under occupation by the Soviets. And, and several people in the community, actually very recently, Elsa, Oscar's sister, told me that uh, she remembers that, that um, Seema Fish, their grandmother, was actually initially welcoming the, that the Germans were coming in because she remembered the, the Austro-Hungarians. And in the intervening two years, the Soviets have been trying to you know, force collectivization on these uh, peasants. And Oscar and his family were relatively wealthy peasants. And so they would have had all their, their property confiscated from them. So initially, some people welcomed the, the Germans kind of as the remembering the, the Germans from World War I. And of course, we know that that was not, not the case. And so here's Oscar's first memory of the war. Oscar, when do you remember the war starting for you and, and, ch and things starting to change for, your, for you and your family? We were playing this, this game called Kitke, that I, 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 this, uh, which um, on the street, and the German aircraft came over and started strafing the street. Uh, and suddenly I found my father grabbed me and threw me into a ditch like the the, 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 the water in, in the street where, where where we were living so if you had the road and you had the ditches on both sides so he suddenly grabbed me and threw me into the ditch so when the german aircraft came over from the right side we were facing we were in the ditch so that when the strafing took place in that case the boats would fly over us and and when the aircraft came back and made a circle and again strafed everybody and i guess my father threw himself and threw me in the other side so that we, we would be protected against against the bullets so that that took place on a on a friday afternoon before the sabbath so there would have been you know people milling about the street buying things for shabbat dinner lots of children running around and then out of the, uh, without warning out of the blue, these aircraft attack. Uh, this is a, as I showed you from the picture, this is a dirt poor town. It has no strategic military value. So this was simply an attack for the sake of attacking. Uh, and then, and here you can really hear Israel's military experience snap into, into, into practice. And so immediately as soon as the shooting starts, he can anticipate where they are going to, where the bullets are going to fly and where he should take refuge. And so as it's circling around, he's, you know, throwing himself and, and his son, Oscar, against one embankment. And as the aircraft moves around, he throws it to the other side. And so those sorts of um, instincts and that experience in this sort of circumstance um, became invaluable. Uh, shortly after this happened, the Germans themselves march into the town and, you know, many of the things that happened throughout the rest of Europe 
uh, the familiar pattern of you know the establishment of a Uden rat and the you know requirement to wear armbands. Uh, that also happens in Podhaitze. They construct a ghetto kind of on the main street where the Jews are living, and they herd the Jews from the surrounding region into this ghetto. Uh, Oscar and his family, their house is, is contained within the walls of the ghetto, so they don't have to relocate, but um, I, some of their family members crowd in with them, and so they're, they're you know, crowded in this small two-room building with mud floors. And uh, many people in the ghetto, and especially Israel, are sort of anticipating that things are going to get even worse, and so they start to construct hiding places and bunkers underneath their floorboards and between the walls, uh, underneath the chicken coop and the outhouse and all these sorts of like uh, disgusting and uh, uncomfortable places where people can hide. And um, of course, what sort of happens is that the Germans and their, their Polish and Ukrainian allies uh, periodically launch actions to sort of round up the inhabitants of the ghetto. And the first group are deported. Uh, we now know they were sent to Belzec. The second group were shot almost on the spot. And so when these actions would occur, uh, the, Oscar and his, and his uh, family would take refuge in these, these hiding places and then have to stay there, sometimes standing up to, in their, up to their waist in, in the filth for you know, days on end without food or water, not moving, not making a sound, even after the sounds outside had stopped because there could always be someone up there waiting and listening for when they would emerge. Now, about the same time, Israel makes this decision that the, that the only way that some people are going to survive from this town is that if a young group of people escape from the ghetto into the forest and build a bunker there and, and, and do their best to survive and live off the land and the connections that they have with uh, the forest rangers and the friendly Gentiles that that Israel feels that he can trust from his, you know, earlier days. And so he has three young children that are that are eight and 10 and 12 and, and a wife living in the ghetto and his, his mother as well. And he decides that they are really just going to be an encumbrance and, and there's no way that they're going to survive. And so he abandons his family in the ghetto after making these provisions for them and, and leads a group of young people out into the forest. And this is, this is Oscar describing Israel's sacrifice. Knowing your dad's rationale today and you know, what that sacrifice was to leave his own family behind at the time, how do you feel about that decision and, and what do you think about it now? Uh, I, I understand. You have to realize the circumstances were different then than they are now. Uh, if it would be for me, I wouldn't have done that. I would have think, thought and concentrated on my own family first. My, my, my children, my, my grandchildren and so forth are, are, are important to me. And I would not be the sacrificial type of individual. Uh, you have to realize 1943, 1942, 43, what the circumstances were and the chances of young people surviving when not great, as is obviously from a people from about two and a half thousand Jews, only about 30, 30 15, 30 were left alive, and most of the people were left alive were adult, uh, uh, you know, older people, and ultimately only 15 remained alive. So it's an indication exactly what the circumstances were. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's difficult to, to judge Although I judge him because he basically wanted, didn't care if we died or lived. He was thinking about others. It was the overall group of people that he wanted to, to some should remain alive, not necessarily his own family. So uh, I am, I, I can't condone it because obviously I would be dead, if you will, but, but in circumstances and so forth, I ended up being alive. That's, that's also always a very difficult video to listen to. Um, I think it's probably not quite fair to Israel to say that he didn't care whether his family survived. Uh, he probably cared quite a bit 
that about what would happen to them. But as a soldier, he sort of assessed the situation and 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 realistically guessed that their that their probability of surviving was very low. And as Oscar describes, that sort of played out. And really, it's just luck that Oscar and his siblings survived. Well, it's luck that any of them survived, but even more luck that that these children survived. Um, and, and one of the themes that I want to touch on here, and then I'll come back to it again, is that judging the past from the present perspective is a very difficult thing to do, and we should be very wary of doing so, because it's impossible to put ourselves into these difficult situations where you're really choosing between two impossible things. Uh, you're choosing between your family and you're choosing between, I guess, the honor of your people and the, their, the, the future hope for their con con continuation. And so how do you choose between those two things? And what would you choose? I don't think it's really possible to answer that without being in that situation yourself. In any case, um, Israel gets word that the ghetto is going to be liquidated at some point in 1942 fully liquidated. And so he goes back and, and, and they have people sort of that are going between the forest and the ghetto periodically, uh, risking their lives, of course, mostly escaping from the ghetto to the forest. And he decides to go back and rescue his family and, and you know, some of the other survivors from the, from the early year roundups. So he, his, his wife and his children are still living in the ghetto and he takes them into the forest, a number of other people. And now they're quite a large group and they're not just you know, young uh, and healthy people. So they, they divide the group up into three and they all kind of have different hiding spots within the forest so that you know, there's, there's better chance that if one is discovered, at least they're not all going to die. Uh, and then what happens is that the, the local sort of Ukrainian Polish uh, militia that are, are sympathizing and working alongside the, the Germans, they get word that there's a group of Jews hiding in the forest and and they um well they find this they find one of the groups and the, the way they find one of the groups is that one of these people that, that's hiding in the forest basically takes it into his own hands to go and get food for his family because uh they're getting very desperate and people are getting hungry and cold and so even though israel has sort of forbade anyone to have outside contact except for him and his deputies because he feels that only he knows who who he can trust um, this, this individual sort of takes into his own hands to rescue his, himself and his family. And so he goes to a, a Gentile who, who thinks is friendly and he asks him for assistance. And this, this person sort of feigns that, uh, sympathy and says, just let us know where you are and, you know, we'll come and, and rescue you. And that guy tips off the local militia, the militia come in the nighttime and they, they murder the, one of the groups. And while this is happening, uh, Israel is murdered. Now, Bronya and Oscar and his siblings are actually in another group because Israel didn't want to be accused of, of playing favorites. And we only know this because there was uh, somebody who was hiding in the forest and observed the massacre of the second group that escaped to tell the survivors what had happened. And then when word sort of breaks out that the the group with Israel has been murdered and that, you know, one of the leaders and of this sort of uh, group of Jews has been murdered. There's, you know, panic that just breaks out amongst everybody. And uh, Israel's deputy, this guy named Zitzer, decides that okay, this is sort of more than he's bargained for, um, that now, now that the second group has been found and murdered, he just takes his family and leaves and he sort of abandons his charges in the forest. Again, you know, not exactly a, a, a very noble thing to do, but um, again, difficult to judge this man for sort of just taking the opposite decision of Israel, which was, I'm just going to try and save my own family. Uh, and so when this happens, the, the group that Oscar and Branya and his siblings are in sort of starts to dissipate and nobody, you know, really knows what to do. And a group of them end up at a farmhouse of a Gentile uh, seeking help. And so here's what happens next. We, we ran away from, from, from the farm and we ran in all, all directions. Uh, I, uh, my sister my, and, and my brother and some of the other people were running in, in one direction. Um, my mother, 
remember, I remember the valley and so forth that we, we, we were running through. And my mother couldn't run as fast as we. And about 30 yards away from me, she was shot and she fell back. And we ran away into the forest. And this is how we ended up in the forest by ourselves. This is how long after your father was killed? About two weeks, two weeks afterwards, two weeks after my father was, was killed. That's my older brother back there over there that you can see, uh, Jesse. Apparently, he actually looks quite a lot like Israel Silver did. And that's Branya. So that, that what Oscar just told you occurred approximately around August of 1943. And so now uh, Oscar and his two siblings and uh, have escaped into the forest. His mother has been murdered. He witnessed his mother murdered. He knows that his father has been murdered. Uh, and also a significant number of the Jews that they've been hiding with have been found and murdered as well. So they're now orphans living in, in the forest in Eastern Europe in the middle of the Second World War with all of these enemies out hunting for them. Uh, and Oscar's approximately, uh, I guess, 10 years old at this point, 11 years old. And there's, so the next year in change, they are living in the forest and periodically they link up with other groups of Jews that they find hiding in, in bunkers or different places. And, and every so often they risk um, like asking help from a, a Gentile because you know they're hungry and desperate. For the most part, they would sleep in, in trenches that were left over from the First World War and they would cover themselves with leaves during the day to stay warm. And they would move at nighttime only. Um, stealing food from from you know farmers fields and, and the garbage dumps from towns and um, here's here's Oscar sort of describing what it's like to be hungry cold and afraid what was the prevailing emotion running through you on a day on an average day in the forest was it fear anger hatred sadness uh, it, it was definitely no hatred sadness yes Fear, yes. Fear was every second that you breathe, you, you were afraid that you, that's the last minute that you're going to be alive. Uh, the, um, because uh, you knew, at least we were made conscious of the fact that the Ukrainians in, the, in that area were looking for Jews in order to be able to deliver them or to get to, you know, to bring them to the Germans. So that was a little cut off and truncated there. But um, what Oscar means to say is that the reward for uh, turning in Jews dead or alive was sometimes like a sack of sugar or a sack of flour or some kerosene. So these are the kinds of prices on, on human life. And there are really, you know, many, many stories from this time, um, too many to tell right now. Uh, but here's one of the most vivid ones that I, that, that I, that really struck me and my brothers. And this is sort of at one point in the winter of 1943, 44, and they're cold and hungry. And they sort of decide that they, they've had enough, or at least for the time being, and they, they request help from, a, they go up to a farmhouse and they knock on a door and they ask help. And the farmer is a, you know, a, not a not an enemy. He's not. He's also wary of helping them because there's a, a stiff price if you if you are caught hiding Jews. Um, and so he decides that Elsa can sleep in the farmhouse with them because she's a, a, a girl. And the two boys who are circumcised, they have to sleep in the barn so that you know if someone should show up and check, he can at least sort of have pli plausible deniability. Doesn't know that they're there. Um, but that probably wouldn't work either, because if more typically his family would be shot and then he would be shot and his house would be burned down and they might burn down his neighbor's houses too, just for good measure. Um, so they're, they're hiding with this individual and, and then they hear Oscar wakes up in the middle of the night and he hears trucks approaching or he hears people approaching from the forest. And this is what happens next. After my father was killed, sleep for me stopped. I, I, there were nights and nights and nights I wouldn't sleep at all. And uh, my brother, on the other hand, slept all the time. Uh, we 
I, 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 I'm in, in the stable and I hear it's dark and I hear, I, I hear noises coming in from the forest, which is a distance away, uh, talking and so on. And somehow they seems to me that they're coming towards this farmhouse. And uh, the closer they come, in that case, I knew that I had to run away. So I tried to wake up my brother, who was fast asleep, and, uh, and to, to, you know, to, to draw him to, to run away with me. And uh, no matter how much drawing I did, it was impossible to move him. He kept sleeping. So on the last minute, what I did is take a couple of bales of the straw and covered them up with those bales of straw, slid out from the, from the, from the, from the farmhouse. And because it's, it's, uh, it's in August, uh, I crawled through a row of potatoes. You know, when you, potatoes are grown in rows and, 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 and the soil is pushed in, in a triangular mm -hmm. system against, against the roots. So I crawled through the through that through that through, through the path in, in, in between the potatoes and escaped into the forest. Uh, and this was I don't know exactly at night. It was late at night, and I kept going into the forest deeper and deeper and deeper. And then ultimately, I said I, I, I said to myself, I wonder what's, what what happened to my brother. So I worked my way back, tried to work my way back. Uh, the moon, uh, the moon came out, and um, it was it, it was everything was like it, it was on a plate, but it's still it's still dark, and in the distance there were fireflies. When I saw some fireflies, I thought there's a human being standing there, standing and waiting for me, smoking. And I would stop and wait, come a little closer, and realize there was nobody, nobody there, it was just a shadow, okay? And I walked around the farm a couple of times, and I did go in the first time, the second time, a couple of times, and then ultimately worked my way back into the, in, 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 into the, into the farm, in, into the stable, climbed up on the second, uh, on the second um, level, and uh, lifted the straw, and there was my brother sleeping, still asleep. So that's just one example of the sort of daily brushes with death that they would experience. Um, so they're living in, in orphans in the forest. And, oops, I don't know why is this frozen here? So can you? And, um, and then in, in about March and April of 1944, the Red Army is, is moving west across Europe on their way to Berlin, and they liberate Port Heitze. And so this is Oscar describing what it was like to be liberated. Oh, that's... So can you tell me about being liberated? When did it happen? How did it happen? What were the emotions? Well, the, the, the uh, I, I described to you when I was walking on the road when, uh, and, and I was being shot at. And I walked into this village. I walked out with my hands up in the air and walked towards the village. And as I walk into the, the village, uh, I see this Russian soldier with the red star there. I hugged him and kissed him and told him, it, it, obviously, the, the emotion, he, he looked at me because he was a Russian soldier. Like, is he suddenly, why would a, this child jump on him and hug him and kiss him? I told him exactly who, who I was. And I told him and described to him that the fact that there are other people in the forest and he had that we, that we, we are glad that he, you know, that, that the Russians are here. So here's Oscar and his siblings as, as orphans after the war. Um, the 
there were Jewish members of the Russian uh, of the Red Army, and they uh, took sympathy on on these Jewish orphans, and so they sort of were the first people to look after them and care for them. And so there was a period when they were kind of just following the Red Army uh, until they were put in a you know, series of children's homes and these displaced persons camps and then orphanages, and they uh, they end up in a children's home in Lemberg, uh, Lvov. Oscar goes to school for the first time, you know, formally school before he'd only really had Heider a few times in Put Heitze. Um, he plays, you know, plays with children his own age for the first time in, in two years, plays soccer and breaks his arm. Uh, here's, uh, and then, and then, of course, everything was subdued because, I mean, the war was still raging for a period, but there's also extreme deprivation in Eastern Europe because uh, there's there's starvation, there's a lack of food, uh, and everyone is is missing somebody and searching for somebody. And this is what the attitude was like. Do you remember uh, how you felt in the period after the war immediately ended, sort of reflecting back on the insane experience that you had had? We, we didn't know anything what took place in the, in, in the concentration camp. Mm -hmm. Uh, the it was, it was never discussed. It wasn't it wasn't discussed by anybody. The 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 teachers that we had didn't didn't didn't, didn't talk about it. Uh, the people that we came in contact with didn't talk about it. I think it was really everybody was numb. It was it was just we survived in that sense, and then we lived for ourselves. There was no. On a retrospect and a reflection, it's only later on that it came in that you became older, you understood what exactly took place. For instance, in, a, in a, one of the children's homes in Poland, we were in a, 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 a this home, which is Upper Silesia. In Munich, we were there, and there were about a dozen girls who were older. There were 16, 17, 18 year old girls there, and they were. Blonde, blue-eyed, beautiful girls, and they were always staying with them by themselves. There was like like they were ending up ending on a group of, on on their own. Okay, and um, it's only later on that I discovered that you know, in the retrospect, that these girls were the ones that were used by the Germans as you know for for, for the for the soldiers. Mm -hmm. And they happen to survive. There's um, some pictures from that sort of period in the post-war era and the orphanages, Oscar circled in red. Um, what you described there was really a, a frequent occurrence in the Second World War of, of, people, of women being used as sex slaves that happened in the German army and in the Japanese army um, and in a number of other armies as well. And, and sort of you get a sense of Oscar's self-awareness, uh, and and he also you know describes how difficult it was to form connections you know with people that uh, weren't his own age, just because of, of you know in difference of experience that they had encountered. Um, the Jewish agency you know finds these orphans and, and including a number of other orphans, and they're searching for. Uh, families in North America or in Israel to take these orphans. And so uh, Israel, Oscar and Ziggy are brought to Winnipeg and adopted by the Zaretsky and Sudak families, respectively. And Elsa is fostered by a third family also in Winnipeg. And so uh, the, the, the three kids are divided. They're all brought to Canada and they're all cared for in one shape or form, but uh, they're, they're separated after this experience that they've been through which on one hand is very difficult to imagine doing, but also as someone who's adopting a, an orphan from a war, it's also difficult to you know, imagine the burden being imposed and then asks his family to take in three children, not just one. Um, Oscar and, and, and Ziggy were, were pretty well cared for by their adopted families. And Oscar still uses the name of his adopted family today as does Ziggy. Um, Elsa had a much unhappier time of it and, and her foster parents really were somewhat indifferent to her care. Uh, but also Elsa was much was was two years older than than Oscar and and four years older than than Ziggy throughout the entire experience. So of course she was even more mature than Oscar was and, and affected differently. 
after you know going to school in Canada, and he eventually enrolls in engineering in the University of Manitoba. Um, well, actually, before I get too far, this is some pictures of him emigrating to Canada in 1948. Handsome guy. Uh, he goes to the University of Manitoba, and he becomes a civil engineer. Uh, he briefly emigrates to Israel and you know, tries to make a living there, but comes back after a year because of heartbreak. Uh, and so he you know, eventually finds a job building bridges in Toronto. Uh, here's a story about him building his first bridge. Ultimately, he works in, in, the, in the bridge department designing bridges. Talk about uh, designing your first bridge. Some, some, of those bridges are, some of those bridges are still standing. I hope all of them are standing. And I, I designed a bridge. I did, when somebody said, go in this, the Mr. Proctor was about seven feet tall by seven feet wide. They would come in, you're going to design this bridge. Yes, sir. Did I know anything about bridges? Nothing. I was a young kid. What the hell did I know about it? So I studied that night. And I took the code, I studied that night. <clears throat> During the day, I would do the design and do the drawing and so forth that had to be done. And uh, I, I finished it, I finished the designing and everything else. And um, later on, when they were building it, in that case, they sent me out to make sure that the thing was built exactly according to the plans that I did, that I, uh, oh yeah, I had to go to, with those plans, I had to go to the Department of Highways of Ontario, which were which were right on, 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 on the 401 and Islington. It, um, the chief engineer there uh, looked at my plants and everything else, looked at it and asked me certain questions. Everything was fine. In those days, and I could, it didn't take very long, stamped it and said, that's fine, good, good to go. And, um, and the bridge is, is, is even standing today, uh, you know, and this, this was built in 1960. So you're talking about, uh, you know, virtually 1662, okay, you're, you're talking about, 50 years, 57 years later, and the bridge is still there. I pass by every once in a while to make sure the thing is still okay. It stays okay. There's no cracks. So that's the that's my 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 claim to pain. Here's a couple more pictures of Oscar from you know it's uh, early years working as an engineer in Canada. Uh, these are mostly in Manitoba. Uh, he meets my grandmother Ruthie at another wedding uh, in Toronto, and they have a three-week engagement, and then they're married. Um, they have four children, including my mother Rena, who's there next to Oscar. And uh, Ruthie also has a very fascinating story from the Second World War. She was living with her mother, my great grandmother, in the northeast corner, and they also were occupied by the Soviets. And um, Ruthie's father was murdered at Katyn. And Ruthie and, and, and Dora, her mother, were deported to the, the east in Russia, to Siberia, where they spent the war. And Ruthie was, was, was just an infant. And ironically or paradoxically, that, that, that saved them. Of course, they were far away from the fighting when the Germans invaded. And that's how they survived the war. And then they came to Canada, and Ruth met Oscar. And then they had my, my mother, and my mother met my father. And the rest is history. And here's, here's my family today. So this brings us really to, you know, to our conclusions and our lessons from this whole thing, which history doesn't stay in the past. We, you know, unfortunately, we're really experiencing that today with kind of the crumbling of the post-war order. And we're really seeing a lot of the, the dangerous things that happened the last time around starting to reoccur, not just in, not just on, in other places in the world, but also in our own country and especially south of the border. Uh, and this sort of really underscores the importance that we, when we are encountered, when we encounter injustice and intolerance, not just of ourselves, but especially of other people, we have a responsibility to stand up for them because um, it's that sort of collective attitude of being a bystander that allows these injustices to occur. And it also really highlights this idea that there aren't any rights. Security is not a right. It is a privilege. It has been fought for by, by, not least the veterans of this country and the veterans of the other countries that, that won the Second World War, um, but all, including all kinds of people today that still continue to guard those pr privileges. And we have a duty to uh, be involved in that as well. 
And as I said at the beginning of this presentation, my brothers and I undertook this process to uh, record ourselves with Oscar and become witnesses to his testimony. And now I've shared this with you and I will hope that you now feel uh, that you also have responsibility to bear true testimony to others. And I just have, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about this caring testimony project that you just heard. Um, this was, this is a solution to continue Holocaust education uh, without, you know, with a personal connection to survivors, but once the survivors are no longer themselves to tell their stories. And uh, I would like to thank Michelle Glee Goldstein, who I think is also on this call, uh, who was really the impetus for recording, uh, doing the re recording with Oscar. And she had earlier done it with her father, Bill Gleed, who was also a survivor. And Bill was one of, you know, our, 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 our star uh, storytellers in the Cambridge Kitchener Waterloo region uh, before unfortunately he passed away. And Michelle has, you know, really amazingly taken up that responsibility of telling his story for him. And so she, you know, showed us how it's done. And then my brothers and I record ourselves with, with Oscar. We now have 10 recorded survivors. There are four of us that are actively speaking. There are three more uh, developing their presentations. We've reached over 35 schools in mostly the Cambridge, Kitchener, Waterloo region, but also someone in Toronto. Uh, over 4,000 listeners of all ages, but mostly in, in elementary and high schools and mostly non-Jewish, which is in particularly important because they often have had no, no exposure or contact with a Holocaust survivor before. Um, I'm gonna skip over this because this audience already knows that uh, there's hate crime on the increase in Canada. But as a final word from, from Oscar, here, here's Oscar's sort of final words uh, in terms of his warning. So then what, what changed your mind when I was growing up and my brothers and I were younger and I believe it was my father who really approached you and, and said, it was, you know, this is really right. important that you should do and tell them. <laughs> Why did you do that you <clears throat> differently about it? Because some of my friends, as you know, passed on. Mm -hmm. And at this stage of the game, you never know exactly when you are going to be on the other side. Uh, so you knew that at some stage of the game, you had to you had to tell the story to somebody so, so that people would know what took place to me and, and in a direct way to others like me. And you will carry the, the you will carry this this the thought and this ideas and then and knowledge what happened to the Jewish people in Europe uh, <clears throat> and will know that if we behave the way we did in the past and that is the thing will can repeat itself and I didn't want that to happen to you guys and I don't want it to happen to you and to your children and your grandchildren and so forth if we behave the way we did in Europe being passive, we don't have a future. I'll leave you with these two thoughts because they are uh, flip sides of the same coin. And the first is the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And the other side of that is that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful and committed citizens can change the world for indeed it's the only thing that ever has. And it's that one that I find very important because we're privileged enough to live in a democracy and for the time being at least we can still influence the outcome of our public policy and, and we all have a responsibility to do that. I am done. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you so much, Sam. That was absolutely amazing. And thank you, Oscar, I know was listening to this as well for his component in the video. It's really such a testament to have these stories and be able to carry them on. Um, Sam, I was wondering if you could give the audience a little bit of idea. What does it mean to you to be able to share your grandfather's story? Obviously we know there's going to be a time that survivors will unfortunately no longer be with us, but not only to be able to share their story, but to share your own family's story while you're doing it. Um, well, I guess it's a great feeling for sure. I, um, I remember when, when my brothers and I finished, like the very afternoon that we finished the recording, this immense feeling of relief that, you know, okay, we now have it on film. Like we have it recorded, you know, in this bizarre way that, that I mean, memory is fallible. Like you, you end up making mistakes. Um, and so just as a, as a resource to go back and 
and and like I've only shown you like you know cumulative maybe 10 15 minutes of that we have five hours of footage so there's, there's a lot of material um and just as a resource it's invaluable and of course it makes me very connect it makes you feel very connected to Oscar and um and also you know these to, to members of my family that I've never met like Israel and Branya and and um yeah I just find it's very important that their stories are continue to be told I agree I think it's a great resource both for you and your family but also for the world at large I mean you said you do this presentation to students and to, to groups and whatnot so I know you, you had Oscars sort of his lessons at the end which was amazing what lessons would you take away from it? What what do you what do you think is important for people to understand looking at the Holocaust from you know close to eighty years later at this point? Yeah, well, my 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 lessons are those four. Um, particularly as a student of history, we tend to talk about history as these things that you know it, it happened and now we live in the present and the future is going to happen and it's more like this sort of like dynamic flux where the his, history just sort of like pops back up into the present again. And uh, and so that that would be the first one is that it, it could be you. I mean, this is a Jewish audience, so obviously you know it could be you for the most part. But typically, when I give this presentation, it's it's to all kinds of of Canadians, and particularly uh, Canadians of other ethnicities and and and, and uh, you know racial backgrounds. And it's like we have something in common here, and and it's okay. You know, maybe they start with the Jews, but they're just the first ones, and then the, you're also the ones who get persecuted next. And we have this mutual responsibility to be upstanders for one another and to not to be intolerant of intolerance wherever it is to whomever it is. Um, and, and then I, I strongly believe that, the, you know, that there are no rights. We talk about rights, but there aren't any rights. There are only privileges. Well said. We actually have a question from Michelle. Do you think you have a different relationship with your grandfather than most of your peers? Do you think this is a result of his history? How has it affected you? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I don't know. I guess I only know my own experience, but I, I think so. Um, I've always been like felt I've always been close with Oscar long before we had this, these recordings, we would go for walks together, him and I around his cottage up in Muskoka and I kind of, you know, get this story in, in little bits and pieces or we'd go over parts that I'd heard before. And then I guess, uh, yeah, we have, we have lots of things in common. So, so I do feel connected to him in a special way. I imagine that other grandchildren probably feel connected to their grandparents in their own special way, but this is this is my way. And then how it's affected me, I um, I think I really internalized this message. So when when I was 18, I volunteered to serve in the Israeli army and, and that was sort of that there are no rights, there's only privileges piece. And uh, maybe I would have gotten there anyways on my own, but I, I feel like um, knowing where my family had come from and also that I have family in Israel and that they have to serve in the army. It was just like, well, you put two and two together. This happened to my grandparents and this is what my cousins have to do. Then it seems that I should probably do this too. That's amazing. That's so well said. Sam, again, thank you so much on behalf of everyone that's here for joining us today, for sharing yours and Oscar's stories. It meant a lot to all of us. I'm going to turn the stage over to our president and CEO, Michael Levitt. I know he wants to say a couple of words as well. Michael. Thank you so much, uh, Daniela. Sam, that was um, really, really uh, just an incredible journey you took us through. And, you know, to, to Daniela's last question or the question that Michelle posed about the relationship with you and your grandfather, I, I as I was watching this and, and the fact that he's on this Zoom with us this afternoon, I was thinking about the, the nachas and the emotion that he must have um, seeing, being able to see his, his, his grandchildren, after all that he and his family have been through as survivors, see you guys, I, again, take this and bring it and, and continue to, um, to honor the legacy of, of, of those that your family lost, but also, you know, uh, your grandfather. And that must just be a, a tremendous source of pride to him and, and your, you know, and your parents. You talked about bridging the generations at the start of your presentation. And I think, you know, I, week after week or every other week, we hear from survivors, we hear testimony, and we know that we're facing this challenge. We know we're facing this challenge of how are these voices going to continue to be heard? 
How are these lessons that you've talked about at the end? How are we going to continue to stand up and, and motivate um, in communities, not just in Toronto and the people on this call, but what you're doing right now in, in your area? Um, and, and this is the answer. You are, you are actually, you're posing a question and, and, and solving the problem at the same time. And we know that there needs to be these kind of um, initiatives in order to um, transcend the bounds of time mm -hmm. to make sure that we're bringing these voices um, to Canadians and, and far beyond. And, and I just, you know, call a kabod to you, your brothers, and, and, and to Oscar um, and Michelle, because I, I know I committed she is to this program. Um, we, we've had her on and, and do the presentation with, you know, with, uh, with Bill and uh, really this, this is, this is the future. And I just, um, I, I, I want to thank you uh, for, for bringing it to us today. Really, it's, uh, um, it, it's really so important. And to, to our partners uh, at Wallenberg, um, who continue to support and, and message out this program uh, to Irwin, to Sydney, who uh, gave the uh, the intro this afternoon. Thank you, Sydney, for joining us. Um, and uh, to the staff at Wiesenthal, our educational team, uh, who are out from coast to coast to coast virtually pretty much every day these days doing presentations and making sure this exactly the same thing that Sam spoke about. Um, we, you know, the, the, these lessons need to be shared um, beyond our community, which is exactly what so many of the people that I see on today's Zoom, uh, you know, are committed to doing. I, I, I see um, Nate and, and, and others on here. And uh, again, if we can all be part of this effort to make sure that we are, uh, you know, reaching further and further, but testament to you, Sam, and your brothers. This is the way we're going yeah. to achieve that. So um, once again, to all of you that have joined us this afternoon, thank you. Um, you know, a, two weeks time, Daniela, do we know who it is yet in two, two weeks, weeks time? time? Yep, two weeks time on May the 5th is going to be Holocaust survivor Vera Schiff. It's going to be a unique special opportunity. She'll be talking about her story in Theresian stuff, but more than that, her story of love, resistance, and loss, specifically in Tracing Shop, based on a recent book that she published. So it'll be a really interesting speech. We Fantastic. hope to see you thank all you. there. Again, Sam, thank you so thank much you. for being here, part of this today, and all of Next you. Next time in person. Yes, exactly. That would be nice. Yeah. Next time in nice. person would be great. Yeah. Thank you thank so you. much, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. We will see you all here two weeks from today, May the 5th. Thanks thank so much, you. everybody. Bye. Bye.